Welcome, everybody. It is the Maggie Dawn Show, the pre-Thanksgiving edition here on the Civic Media Radio Network. Don't worry. If you might be rolling into a family Thanksgiving weekend and you know you're going to hear some crazy stuff, just download the Civic Media app. It's like an oasis of reasonability, of good information about how we are all here to protect our freedoms and to pursue a place where everybody's vote actually counts. You know, what a novel concept. Next week, I'm I'm really excited about this. I'm going to do a deep dive on the Supreme Court shadow docket. I was incredibly inspired by an NPR piece that I heard. Um, the shadow docket, as we understand it today, wasn't always there. And I think it's really important for all of us to understand how this evolved and the implications that it's having for people's everyday lives and our freedoms and liberties. And so on Monday next week, I'm going to spend probably the whole show um, taking a bit of a dive. You're not going to want to miss that. Uh, it's extremely important where we are today is not where we even were five years ago, and it's not where we were 10 years ago with the way that the Supreme Court is wielding its powers. So not going to want to miss that. Check that out. We're coming back on Monday. Tomorrow, Anya, you're going to be hosting. That's right. I'm going to be covering uh, some of the over-the-phone scams that have been happening to older Americans, especially some really interesting testimony from a guy who received this really elaborate AI-assisted scam call. They used samples of his son's real voice and made it sound like his son's real voice asking his father for help. They had multiple phone numbers, a fake courthouse. It was a whole thing. So I'll be talking about things we all need to watch out for when the phone rings and you think, oh, I'll just answer it. Hello. What you say next could be uh, could be really important or what they say next could be really, really shocking. So, yeah. Nobody's going to want to miss that. Nobody. It's like a public service announcement for everybody that cares about keeping their good, hard-earned money in their pocket. That's tomorrow with Anastasia Esther. I'm Maggie Dawn. If you want to join us on this pre-Thanksgiving episode of the Maggie Dawn Show, 844-967-2789, there's a couple of bits of sound that I want to just go to directly. One of the things that I've always found really interesting about um, the language that is used often to separate us, to try to create um, division where there actually isn't any, is this concept that I frequently hear from one side of the aisle about the elites. And I've always found that to be um, a bit objectionable, not only because I think by the definition that's used by one side of the aisle, I might be considered an elite, right? I've got a law degree. You know, I... I, I'm an economist. I get a graduate degree in economics. But guess what? I come from, you know, the near northwest side of Milwaukee. I drive an O2 Honda. I went to college and graduate school and law school on scholarships. I don't consider myself an elite. I consider myself solidly middle class and someone who will always be solidly middle class. And I've devoted my life to public service. So this concept of elites and who is elite and who gets to decide who's elite, I find really interesting. And so it came across my radar that uh, Donald Trump had been leveling certain pejorative criticisms of George Clooney. And someone recently asked, the actor George Clooney, what his response to all of this was. And there's some adult language here. We've we've got a clean version of it, of course. But I think what Mr. Clooney had to say 
speaks a, to a lot of truth about, wait a minute, <laughs> most of us are middle class. And let's ask ourselves, who exactly is it that's calling us elites or trying to use this language to make some of us feel like we're not actually in the same boat together? So, Anya, I, I thought Mr. Clooney's response to these criticisms was quite to the point. If you would, please. Let's listen to a little bit of George Clooney responding to Donald Trump calling him an elite. I know Donald Trump. You know, I mean, that's the thing is people, you know, I have his phone number in my phone book. He was he was the guy that came to the bars and and asked me about which which cocktail waitress was single. You know, that's who he was. This is back in the 90s. Not that long. No, back in the 2000s, quite honestly. And uh, and so there, there's this part of you that just goes, well, that guy shouldn't be. But I was wrong, and he was, and uh, and our uh, democracy, uh, I believe, paid a price, certainly around the world. When Mr. Clooney goes on for a bit, any any, I don't know if we've got more sound from this, do we? No, but Mr. Clooney goes on to describe the fact that he grew up in the Midwest, and that he worked all manner of jobs. And yes, he eventually broke through and had, you know, has enjoyed much success. But I find, you know, when someone like Donald Trump, who was given absolutely every economic and social advantage that a person possibly can be, who had their business seated and given to them by their parents, I find it quite audacious, quite uh, ballsy would be a word, for someone like Donald Trump to call me middle-class Maggie an elite. Uh, so if you're interested in hearing more from George Clooney, go check that out, because I think the rest of the interview is a little bit hard to air, because there's some expletives in there. It's very entertaining. But I wanted to sit for a minute on on Donald Trump this afternoon. Before we get to what you are not going to want to miss this hour on the Maggie Dawn Show, I'm going to be joined by Aicha Sawa, Sawa, the current city of Milwaukee comptroller, which is their chief fiscal officer. Um, we're going to talk a bit about why she's chosen to not run for real action after one term and you know how challenging it is, I think, for women in electoral politics. So stay tuned. You're not going to want to miss that. But there's been a lot of debate. There was this recent Colorado state court ruling about whether or not Donald Trump can be on the ballot, and the court ruled that he could. And the court also made very clear that Mr. Trump engaged in an insurrection. And while I am a learned lawyer on many points, I would never call myself a constitutional scholar. And there are such learned lawyers, and one of them is a guy by the name of Lawrence Tribe. He's been a constitutional scholar of some renown for quite some time. And Larry Tribe had this interview recently with Katie Quirk, and I'm going to let Anya pick some of the sound. But this is Lawrence Tribe, a, a constitutional scholar. I think the man's got to be nearly in his 70s, if not in his 70s. He's been doing this a very long time. He's taught constitutional law. And he's describing the analysis under the 14th Amendment of whether or not Donald Trump should actually be permitted to run for president. Let's let's take a listen to constitutional scholar Larry Tribe discussing the 14th Amendment question. University. And I know you and Judge uh, J. Michael Ludig, who is a former federal judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit, believe that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment effectively prohibits Donald Trump from ever being president again. Can you explain in simple terms how you've come to that conclusion? 
Sure. Both Judge Ludig and I have studied the 14th Amendment for a very long time, and it is one of the most important parts of the Constitution. The 14th Amendment is the part of the Constitution that basically, after the Civil War, said that states cannot violate certain rights on the part of their citizens. But it also said in Section 3 that anyone who takes an oath to support or defend the U.S. Constitution as an officer under the United States, and who then engages in insurrection or rebellion against the Constitution, can never again hold any office. It's very straightforward. We've never before had a president who, at least apparently, tried to turn the Constitution upside down by violating the provision that says, if you lose a presidential election, you leave. You don't try to hold on. You don't, among other things, have fake electoral slates or rile up a mob to sack the Capitol during the time that they are officially counting the electoral votes. And yet that is what it looks like Donald Trump did. So Judge Ludig and I concluded fairly simply that this basic protection of democracy, the provision that says you're not eligible for another bite at the apple if you try to crush it the first time, that applies to Donald Trump. That is the, the root here. And what I'd also, or what I'd like to sort of gather our thinking around is, is this fundamental concept that regardless of our politics or our policy preferences, there has to be a shared expectation that our elected officials will respect our freedoms and our rights of all American citizens, no matter who voted for you or didn't. And when you have a man who is announcing repeatedly and very clearly that he's going to have an enemies list and that only those loyal to him will enjoy the full protections of the law, we have a problem. We're going to be back in a minute. You are listening to the Maggie Dawn Show. Keep it locked after these. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Maggie Dawn. You are listening to the Maggie Dawn Show here on the Civic Media Radio Network. Are you taking a long drive this weekend to go visit family, friends, and loved ones? Eat your turkey and pumpkin pie. Take Civic Media with you. Go download that app from your favorite app store. It is free. You're going to love having it at your fingertips. You can join us, 844-967-2789. Um, so... There was a press conference yesterday. Uh, Joe Biden's, President Biden's press secretary was describing a whole manner of things, responding to lots of stuff. Now, most of the time, and indeed yesterday, the press actually gets sort of an outline of what's going to be talked about. And so a huge portion of what was going to be, what was talked about yesterday was the press secretary presenting the price of regular consumer goods a year ago or two years ago and the price of consumer goods today. And it was very interesting. One network chose to cut away when they went to that segment of the press conference. Let's take a listen. Time, just in time for holiday travel, gas prices are down $1.70 from their peak. Airline tickets are down 13% over the last year, and car rentals are down about 10%. And as we start preparing our Thanksgiving meals, grocery inflation is at its lowest level in over two years, with prices for eggs, milks, bacon, and fresh veggies lower than last year. In fact, according to the American Farm Bureau, the cost of a Thanksgiving dinner fell this year. Prices are down for turkey, stuffing, peas, cranberries, pie crust, and whipping cream. We had a big discussion about whipping cream in the back. I don't know what whipping cream is. I know whipped cream, but not whipping cream. Anyway, because wages are rising. <laughs> it's great. It's this great. 
So what she's describing is wages are rising, prices are down, so your dollar is going further. But it's interesting, again, the, the major networks, everybody in the press room, they have advanced notice of, of when the, like the outline of things. And so you can literally check the, oh, we're coming to the portion of the press conference where they're going to be talking about the fact that things are more affordable for Americans this year than they were last. Oh, and Fox News cut away, stopped airing the press conference. And then Jason Chaffetz, a well-known personality on Fox News, went ahead a little bit later in the day and said this nugget. Jason, you're a messenger. You've messaged in Congress. I mean, I think it's time to throw out Bidenomics. $90 for a turkey. The price of stamps is up 32% in the last four years. 90, let's, but it's, just, let's just listen. Let's just $90 for a turkey. I'm not sure what turkey he's talking about or from where, but here are the facts. The price of turkey per pound was $1.68 on average nationwide a year ago. It is currently $1.25. That is a 25% drop in turkey prices. If you are going to spend $90 on a turkey, it would need to be a 70-pound turkey. I don't even think they come that big, y'all. I mean, you cut away from the actual economic facts. Then you put someone like Jason Chaffetz on the air who's talking about a $90 turkey and stamps. By the way, the USPS has been rising raising the price of stamps across all presidential administration. If you care about middle-class Americans, and I'm one of them, maybe I'm going to start by going the, the moniker middle-class Maggie. Stop lying to me about what things cost. Stop creating fear where I shouldn't be fearful. Because I want to know actually what the facts are, and I want the people that are telling me the news, and I want my president and his press secretary actually telling me what the facts are. And the facts are that across literally the basket of consumer goods that most of us will be buying or have bought for this weekend's gatherings, it's all cheaper than it was last year. So I say bravo to Bidenomics. And shame on you, Fox News, for again lying to the American people. We all deserve a goodly bit better than that, at the very least. Now, coming up in a little bit, we're going to have Aicha Sawa, the current city of Milwaukee comptroller. If you're thinking to yourself, what the heck is a comptroller? It's the chief fiscal officer. I have spent some goodly amount of time on these airwaves talking about the sales tax that was recently adopted by the city and the county and how important this was to avert immediate term fiscal crises. You're not going to want to miss our discussion because Ms. Sawa has decided not to run for a second term. So an incredibly important elected office at the city of Milwaukee is going to be open. Now, that's very rare. In the last probably 25, 30 years, there's only been four elected comptrollers of the city of Milwaukee, Jim McCann, Marty Matson, Wally, Wally Morix. I forgot about Wally. Let me do this again. Jim McCann, Wally Morix, Marty Matson, and Aicha Sawa. Over 30 plus years, that's an incredibly stable chief fiscal officer. And now at this time where the city of Milwaukee and Milwaukee County needed to ask the state for these this additional revenue source in terms of a sales tax. And yes, it is giving us a moment where we all can breathe a little bit. But make no mistake, the fiscal challenges for both Milwaukee County and the city of Milwaukee aren't going away. The shared revenue formula that the state has used 
and slightly improved still does not work for the largest, most densely populated region in the state, the economic engine of Wisconsin, that is the city and Milwaukee County. And so the need for a steady hand at the wheel in the city and the county is very real. And at the same time, Ms. Sawa has announced that she will not seek a second term. Milwaukee County's comptroller also has announced that he will not seek another term of office. And Mr. Scott Mansky has been in his office for over 15 years. He has been the elected comptroller of Milwaukee County since it was an elected office. So we're going to talk about that when you come back. You're not going to want to miss that because it is these kinds of offices within government that many might not know exactly what these folks do that have an immediate and direct impact on our quality of life. Because the fiscal sustainability of our local government, which is in large part nonpartisan, is such an essential part of the quality of life and our day-to-day -day enjoyment. Keep it locked here on The Maggie Dawn Show. Join our conversation, 844-967-2789, here on the Civic Media Radio Network. Welcome, everybody. I am Maggie Dawn. You are listening to The Maggie Dawn Show here on the Civic Media Radio Network. I am joined by Aichisawa, City of Milwaukee's current comptroller, which is the chief fiscal officer for Wisconsin's largest city. So for all those folks out there that's like, comptroller, what the heck's that? Why, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody you what it is that you and your office do. All righty. Hi, Maggie. Good Thanks to see you. Me. Yeah, it's great to have you back. What does the comptroller do? We are the chief finance officer of the city. I am responsible for everything, including <laughs> everything finance. I am the last double check on anything, payroll, accounting, doing the whole financial statements for the city. We are... Um, we are, uh, what is, what's the word I'm looking for? We are that last double check for you, the taxpayer, that independent advisory double check um, chief financial officer for the city that is not beholden to the mayor or the council. Yeah, when you're elected and you're a chief financial officer, a chief fiscal officer for a governmental ed entity, it's everything from preparing the financial statements, assessing um the financial status of that governmental entity auditing, right? Right. Um, pension funding, which has been an issue for both the city and the county. Um, and frankly, providing a reporting in a way to, to average taxpayers that help folks understand how the city is managing its finances. It's a really interesting position because that's your role, but you don't get to make the actual decisions. Right. Which I've found as a chief legal officer, right? We, we have uh, different expertise, but they speak to one another. You know, we provide guidance and input in our particular subject matter areas, but we don't actually get to make the decisions. So what happens, I to help folks understand, if you think something is financially unwise for the city. How do you provide that information to elected officials? What's the process? Like, do you get to veto things if they're bad? Like, how does that work? Well, we have no voting rights. 
as you said. So we do not get to veto. The most we can do is state our case and try to persuade in the interests of the city's fiscal health. So usually in that case, I, if it is something that I need to make known, I usually let both sides of the second floor, which is the council and the mayor, usually let them know pretty equally since I'm not, again, beholden to either of them. I'm not specifically loyal to either one of them, right? I'm just loyal to what's best for the city. So when something needs to be raised, we bring it up with the budget office, the budget director who works for the mayor generally. And that's a different wrinkle because it's like two finance, two top finance people in the city. So it creates a little bit of an issue, but so not a bad issue. No, it's just the, the way that city government and most government offices, including the federal government, work is that within the executive branch of government, the, ex the chief executive officer of, of a governmental entity prepares a budget and that's submitted to the legislature, in the city's case, the Common Council for smaller towns, villages, et cetera. You have a similar setup of some form. Right. Um, and it's interesting. Th those two branches are the one that ad adopt a budget. And yet here in the city of Milwaukee, you have a chief fiscal officer that's elected, which means neither the mayor nor the legislature can remove you. So you're trying to help them make good financial and fiscal decisions. So you'll communicate when you think something is a risk for the city. What form does that take? Are these private communications? Does it start there? Does it move? Will you take a public position in like a hearing? How does that work for people? How, how do they pay attention to what your counterparts yeah. in different jurisdictions are doing? Yeah, I think... Obviously, it depends on the situation. Um, I I have broken out and said a couple things the first time at the Finance and Personnel Committee of the Council, and has and that's created, a public hearing. It's a public hearing, so that has created some waves on the news that I had to give. But it doesn't matter, right? You have to give it out, and it was a public. It was a budget hearing. Um, other times, it's maybe it starts with a private com conversation and moves into a public communication. Uh, just it really depends on what the issue is, and you know if it's something that's small enough that can be kind of remedied beforehand, or if it is a large enough issue. It depends. Again, it depends on what I think the risk to the city is and if it needs to be publicized, because unfortunately or fortunately, there are a lot of uh, issues that I think the public deserves to know, and it, it doesn't need to be, you know, wrapped up and be a secret. Right. Which means that whomever is the elected chief financial officer of Milwaukee County or the city of Milwaukee, they're exercising an, an incredible amount of judgment, right? And discretion in what they should publicize or write a sort of a formal communication to the council or share right. with the finance and budget committee. So there's a lot of judgment that you're exercising. You're making calls about, hey, this is important enough that I need to go out there and, and say something out in the public. Is that, do those things come up frequently? Um, no, I mean, yes and no. I think that it, I think again, it just, it depends on the situation. I think there were some things that came up during like the budget hearings and the budget mm -hmm. hearings were a very appropriate time to pretty much talk about anything Yes, since you're going into the next year. Uh, there's a lot of them that, you know, don't, you know, go around like the council cycles of the meetings. So those are, you know, those issues, those mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. So you talk about them with the mayor or the council president or the finance chair. It really just depends. I mean, uh, there's a lot of times where, like, related to debt or our bond ratings, whatever they may be, we just send out, we write a nice email, like you said, explaining the situation, what happened, and we send it to both sides of the aisle, kind of like what I was saying. So, And those emails are public they're records. They're public record, <laughs> right. And that's really, really critical. So for those of you who might not be, you know, up on municipal finance things, um, 
municipalities in the state of Wisconsin and counties. So the city and county can issue debt. And then just like uh, a consumer who has credit card debt or a mortgage or a car loan, you have a particular credit rating. Either you're a, you're, you're a reliable credit risk, meaning you'll pay that debt back, or maybe you're a little bit riskier. And if you are riskier, you'll pay more to, quote, finance right. that debt, which means the interest rates will be higher. Right. And in the city of Milwaukee, we have for many years had a very strong credit rating. There's been some downgrades. But what that means for taxpayers is if your credit rating slips, you effectively pay more in interest payments to manage that ongoing debt load. So th the point I'm, I'm sort of circling around here, I try, and, and then I'll ask you the real question that I'm trying to get to, is that whomever is this chief financial officer for the city of Milwaukee or Milwaukee County, they exercise an incredible amount of professional judgment. They exercise that in how they help educate both the legislative and executive branches about what's good fiscally for that jurisdiction, but also about what they take public stands on. And so as you're leaving office, what would you say to voters out there? How important would you tell them an office like yours, the comptroller's office, or the city attorney, a legal office, these things that seem a little bit technical and sometimes hard to understand exactly what we do. How important are these offices to taxpayers and residents in the city of Milwaukee? What I would say is these offices are extremely important. They can even be more important than, you know, specific county supervisors or alders in the sense that they are independently elected working professionals. It is some, it, it, these are like two offices that really provide stability to the city or to the county or whichever organization it is. And that stability, like you said, is really a kind of, it's kind of like the glue that holds the city together. And it, it holds it together in a very understated, non-visible kind of way. Because like you said, most people don't know what the city, I mean, the city attorney, you can kind of guess, right? What does the attorney do? But in an understated way, no one really knows what these people do on a daily basis and what they're really doing for the city and the amount of you know, brain power yes. and impact they are utilizing just to maybe save the city from some grave thing that could have gone wrong. You know, you don't know what these people do behind the scenes on a daily basis. It is a little, people don't think about it, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes. So as we approach this next election cycle and the city comptroller is going to be open for re-election and Milwaukee County's comptroller is going to be open for re-election. Now, Scott Mansky at the county side has been in that role for a long time. You have worked in the city of Milwaukee's comptroller's office for a very long time as well, but you've spent one term as an elected official. I was wondering, can you share with folks, why is it that you've made the decision for you and your family to not seek re-election? Well, I did a lot of soul searching and I lost a lot of sleep, a lot of sleep. I think, um, this is something that probably women, women, I feel like definitely think about these things very long and hard. But I, I just, you know, when I'm done with my term, I will have served the city for 14 years. And even before that, I worked at the state and I audited governments in my past jobs as well. So I've really been in public service my entire first half of my career. And I, do, I love it. I love using my business degree for everything. But just personally, I just felt like I needed to move on to a different opportunity. But I grappled with it a lot. Um, I have an amazing management and senior management team. And we've accomplished so much in one term that 
safe to say that, you know, previous controllers might not have accomplished. I, you know, we did an open checkbook. So you can go on our city's website, you can go on the controller website and click through and you can find any vendor, any payment the city has made. And we update it monthly. So you can see anything. I, we've, yeah, we've, gotten awards for financial statements that we hadn't had in like four decades before that. So definitely kind of up the game in terms of transparency. And I'm really proud of everything we've done. But I feel like I maybe I just need to go make a difference somewhere else. <laughs> it, it's having served in government myself for over a decade now. It's it's an incredible privilege. It's always an honor to serve in those ways. It's also incredibly personally taxing, especially you and I are sort of kismet right. friends and we've known each other for a long time. Um, when you serve in these professional and technical ways for these jurisdictions, again, we don't ultimately make these decisions. And uh, the political climate today is so markedly different than it was even five years ago. Did that come into your thinking at all? Has that changed your view of public service? I think I think being in the trenches of the politics has changed it for sure. I think it was eye-opening and I think it was something that um, that has changed, you know, my viewpoint on politics forever. I just think that um, being in a technical role, we, I feel like I needed that. It was just, there was too much to get. Welcome back, everybody. I am Maggie Dawn. You are listening to The Maggie Dawn Show here on the Civic Media Radio Network. If you want to join us for the last segment, 844-967-2789. We have been joined by Aicha Sawa, the current city of Milwaukee comptroller, the chief fiscal officer of the city. And I did a crappy job as the host trying to give you enough time to answer what I think is a really critical question, and that is, how does the politics of being an elected official, how has the politics of an elected official, if at all, impacted your decision to not seek a second term, Aicha? Especially, if I can be honest, as a woman and as a woman who's an elected official in a technical, professional role serving political arms of government. I would say that it it wasn't the one thing that led me to not rerun. It was a culmination of kind of a lot of the things that I mentioned before. And it was just, I think, where I am in my own career. But I will say that kind of being in the middle of those two political bodies, you 
you, like we were talking about before, you have to kind of be careful and you strategize on kind of when you tell someone something, what risks are you, you know, opening the city up to or not opening the city up to or covering by telling someone. So there are a lot of kind of risk management, I guess, type um, strategies that you do mentally, which isn't just the technical part, right? There's like two different types of energy and work that you are um, that you are doing. The one is communicating and doing the actual technical work and then figuring out what you need to communicate from that. But then the human side and the strategy side of how and when to communicate that. So there is an at the top being the elected, you are generally doing that top, but also making sure that the technical is all in line. So it's a culmination of two different types of work together and not just doing the actual like leading the organization within yeah it's it's really as a technical person that works in government um it, it, to me it's been remarkable in my career the amount of um effort and attention that has to be paid to the politicization of the technical expertise that what you say as a professional trying to provide advice and guidance to folks that for better or worse are subject to election cycles can be extraordinarily challenging. Let's go quickly to the phones. Mark from the SAC. Happy Thanksgiving. Say hi to Aicha. What is your comment or question this afternoon? Hi, Aicha. Yeah, thank you so much for taking my call. It was, it's heartening to me that, uh, the whole Lawrence Tribe pointed out the whole um, any office under the United States is included under the 14th Amendment under the Insurrection Clause. And uh, that was my thought all along that it's just, and I'm not wrong headed in thinking that. And because Donald Trump is a screaming, you know, Hamilton's Federal 75 warning about uh, a corrupt chief magistrate. I mean, that and he continues to, you know, the nonsense we're hearing now is all these people they broke into the Capitol on, on January 6th. Now they're saying, well, some of them were so peaceful. Now, my point would be that every single one of them that broke into the Capitol that day was in violation of at least, you know, criminal trespass and being part of the whole activity itself. So, I mean, trying to write off some of these people as, oh, they're just little innocent tourists is just a load of crap. Yeah, it's it's a difficult moment. Mark, tell Aicha, thank her for her public service and service, not yeah, just of the city of Milwaukee. Service. Yeah. It, thanks so much, thank Mark. You. It, it's incredible to me. And, and thank you, Aicha, for being here again. I hope you consider coming back and sharing with folks what, what you understand about government and these technical jobs within government. Um, before I came on the show this evening, I was gathered with a bunch of my colleagues from Milwaukee County, and we were, were celebrating the passage of the budget. Um, which is sometimes a labor of love, a labor of pain. It's it's a lot of things. But I wanted to emphasize, and I think it's appropriate in this moment, that government, when it works well, is fueled by folks like Aichasawa, who are technical experts who show up every day to provide their professional best in the service of all of the people of the jurisdictions that they work for. And as we go into this weekend where we gather with family and friends, it is so critical that we understand and appreciate the work that these professionals do. And when we talk about civil servants, we talk about people who are not there to serve political agendas or personal ones. They are there to serve all of the public by bringing their professional best. I, for one, have found it the greatest credit of my career to serve in this capacity. I thank you, Aicha, for your service to the city over these many years. And as we consider the candidates going into this 2024 cycle, let us try to lift up and affirm those that serve all, regardless of party, and do so with professional integrity. The world needs good public servants and elected officials who respect that.
My name is Maggie Dawn. You've been listening to The Maggie Dawn Show. I wish you all a very blessed and safe weekend together. Let us always remember to lift up and respect Native Americans who may not be celebrating as we all may be this weekend.